Hi everyone, it's seven o'clock, so I think we'll get started. I know some people are still joining us. Um, hopefully everybody will be in by the time we get to uh, the nuts and bolts of Perry's presentation. I'm just going to give um, a couple of opening remarks and welcome everyone, and then we will turn it over to our presenter for today. So I'd like, to, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our Fall 2020 Let's Talk Education Community Speaker presentation. We're so glad you could join us this evening. My name is Jen Heidenheim and I'm the Administrative Assistant uh, for the Research Office at Western's Faculty of Education. The Community Speaker Series is presented by the Faculty of Education at Western and it's our chance to share some of our exciting research with the wider London and area community. Typically, these events are held in person at the Downtown Library, and we would like to acknowledge our ongoing relationship with the London Public Library, and we look forward to co-hosting the speaker series again with them as soon as we can. We would also like to thank the London District Catholic School Board and the Thames Valley School Board for helping us promote this event, and would like to welcome some of our uh, teachers from further afield. I know there's some people from here on Perth, so welcome. The format of today's presentation will be a talk by Dr. Klein, during which all audience members will be muted, and then we will have a question and answer session where we'll be able to um, let you speak and um, will you, or you could use the chat function as well. Um, if you would like to be added to our email list and receive announcements about future events, please send a private chat message to the moderator with your email address. Um, you can also um, contact us through our website. Please note that this talk will be recorded and a link will be available on our website and on the event post for anybody who couldn't make it in person. Um, we will move on to our land acknowledgement statement. We would like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lepeawik, and Adirondon peoples on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, Wampum. With this, we respect the long-standing relationships that Indigenous nations have to this land as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that the Indigenous people, like First Nations, Métis and Inuit, endure in Canada, and we accept responsibility as a public institution to contribute towards revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing our respectful relationships with the Indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. I'll now introduce this evening's speaker. Dr. Perry Klein began his career as a teacher in North York, Ontario. He completed a PhD in educational psychology at the Centre for Applied Cognitive Science at the University of Toronto. He leads a team working on a shirk funded project on early intervention in writing. Dr. Klein currently serves as Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Education in Western University and is a member of Western Center for the Science of Learning. All right, I will now switch to Perry's presentation. And there we go. Take it away, Dr. Klein. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to thank Jennifer for that introduction and land acknowledgement and also her work in organizing all of the talks in our community speaker series. Okay, my talk tonight is going to be about helping beginning writers find success. Uh, and, and in the talk, I wanna focus on, on two groups of students. Uh, first, students who are typically developing. These are students who we might think of as um, average achieving or high achieving students. Uh, and the other group that I want to focus on is writers who are struggling for any kind of reason. And I'll talk about some of the reasons that writers may face difficulties in a few minutes. The approach of my talk is going to be evidence-based. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, most of what I'll be talking about tonight uh, will be based on research evidence. Uh, and the kind of evidence that it's based on is uh, experiments in instruction. Uh, so these are studies where children's writing is initially assessed, uh, then some kind of teaching method is used, and then their writing is assessed again. And what we're looking for is substantial improvements in the quality of their writing. Um, uh, the group that receives that kind of instruction would be compared to a control group. And then we would be looking for not just one study of that kind, uh, but would, we would want replication. We would want a number, we'd want to see a number of studies that are all pointing to similar findings. 
Um, most of what I'll be talking about will be strongly evidence-based. Some of the parts of what I'm talking about uh, are more novel or speculative, and so I'll indicate that as we go along. Um, I want to focus on recent research, uh, and that's really the reason for tonight's talk. Um, research on uh, beginning writers has really accelerated in the past five years, and especially research on how to um, prevent difficulties in writing and how to help struggling writers right from the beginning of their education. Um, the reason for that shift in writing research toward younger writers uh, is, is this. Um, in the past, the approach that schools often used is that if, it, if children were having difficulty uh, learning to read and write, uh, then the common practice was to wait until the children were about 10 years old in grade four, uh, and then to have an assessment with a school psychologist. And then if the child was as identified as having a reading disability, then the child would go into special education. And that was the dominant practice in schools for several decades. Um, but what's now recognized as best practice is, is not waiting uh, until the middle of elementary school uh, to act and instead trying to help children to succeed from the beginning of their education. Um, this is an approach that first became dominant in reading. And then over the past five years, it started to become more prevalent in writing as well. Um, the fourth thing I want to uh, use in my approach to this talk is uh, a practical perspective. Um, so the ideas that I'm talking about tonight are meant to be ideas that are doable in terms of, of time and cost and so on. Uh, so these are things that parents or teachers might consider implementing right away if they wished to. Okay, children can struggle with writing for many reasons. Um, one kind of reason is a learning disability. For example, if a child has a learning disability in reading, then their writing will be impacted as well. Um, children can have a developmental language disorder. This is what we used to call um, language delay or specific language impairment. Um, children with ADHD typically struggle with writing. Uh, children with emotional and behavioral disorders are often behind in writing. Um, right now in London, we have many children who have interrupted formal education. So these would be children who have missed years of school. For example, these could be children who are refugees from countries who are at war. And so they could be joining elementary school in the middle school years or the, the latter part of elementary school, but they may have only had uh, one or two or three years of formal schooling. Children can also struggle with writing for reasons we don't know. Uh, and finally, writing is just hard for everyone. Uh, very few people would say that writing is something that's always easy. Writing has a kind of inherent challenge to it because it requires that we think about, um, we think about the ideas that we're putting together, how to connect those ideas, um, how to put those into language, um, spelling words, forming letters, and so on. All of these things are happening at the same time. So writing is inherently challenging. So I want to start by talking about what skills beginning writers need in order to succeed. Um, so first, just to be clear, when I'm talking about writing, what I mean is the child's ability to create a text. Uh, so this could be, for example, writing a story. Um, children in the early elementary grades, uh, they write uh, true stories about themselves, uh, often in the form of a journal, for example. Um, they write imaginative stories. They may write a report for the teacher. They might write uh, instructions for someone on how to do something like play a game. Um, so all of those things, creating a text, uh, are what I mean by writing. Um, one of the important things that feeds into writing is the child's discourse language. Um, what I mean by discourse language is this. Uh, children's oral language is an important influence on their writing. And so they have oral language at the level of the word, that's their vocabulary. 
Um, they have oral language at the level of the utterance or the sentence, and so children's sentences can be um, more complex or less complex. But then discourse is the level of language above that. It's the way in which children put sentences together. So for example, discourse language would be reflected in the child's ability to tell a story orally. It's that discourse level that's a particularly important influence on the child's writing development. So for example, a child who is able to tell a good story orally will also tend to be able to write a story well. Children who struggle with telling a story or orally will also struggle with writing a story. Handwriting. Um, what I mean by handwriting is, uh, is either what we would call in Ontario printing or manuscript uh, or else cursive. Uh, but in any case, it's the child's ability to form letters. Um, some important characteristics of children's ability to form letters they need to know how to form all of the letters. Uh, they need to be able to, to print clearly enough to be able to read their own printing. Uh, and they need to be able to print fairly fluently. That is, they need to be able to, to print or write um, quickly enough to keep up with the speed of their thought as they're creating a story. Um, children who struggle with handwriting will tend to also struggle with written composition. Uh, and finally, spelling. Um, children's ability to spell words is an important influence on their written composition. This includes being able to spell words that are phonetically regular, words they can sound out like cat, uh, as well as being able to spell words that are phonetically irregular, um, words like there, for example. So how can we teach writing effectively in classes where students have a wide range of writing skills? And what I want to suggest is that there, there are lots of aspects to this issue and lots of things teachers would be considering as they're thinking about teaching a diverse class. Um, but one of the powerful approaches is to work on the language abilities that feed into written composition. Um, this has really been the approach of instructional psychology or a dominant approach in instructional psychology for the last few decades. Um, we try to understand the trajectory of development for a domain like writing. Uh, we try to understand what skills feed into it and then we work with children on those skills in order to improve their achievement. So, um, so what I'm going to suggest is that it's important for teachers to work with kids on discourse language, handwriting, and spelling. And if we do those things, then it's likely that their, uh, their written composition will improve substantially. Uh, and that if teachers use this kind of approach, it will tend to reduce the gap between lower achieving and higher achieving kids in a class. Uh, so let's start with discourse language. Um, an effective approach to teaching discourse language is strategy instruction. Um, this is what I mean by a strategy. Uh, here's a student and she's writing a story. She's writing a story about herself. Uh, and so the child has a plan um, and this is what's in her plan. Uh, she thinks to herself, first I'll write the topic, then the setting beginning, middle, end, and my feeling. So this is her strategy, and it has one, two, three, four, five, six steps, right? So this is going to help her to generate ideas and to sequence those ideas. Students who have strategies uh, tend to be good writers. On the other hand, if children don't have strategies for writing, then they tend to struggle with uh, creating texts. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a teacher or you're a parent and you've worked with a struggling writer, um, you'll know that it's a common kind of scenario is that they'll sit down to write uh, and they'll look at their paper, they'll pick up their pencil, and very often what they'll say is, I don't know what to say, or I can't think of something to write. And so having a strategy is a kind of uh, remedy to that in the sense that the strategy gives the child a 
tools uh, to generate ideas and to sequence those ideas. So a question is, can we teach a writing strategy to children in grade one? Um, this is a, an interesting kind of question because uh, there's lots of research on strategy instruction at this point. There have probably been about 120 experimental studies on the effectiveness of writing strategy instruction. And teaching writing strategies to kids is highly effective. Um, but almost all of that research focuses on children in the middle elementary grades and upper elementary grades. So mostly grade three to grade eight. Um, a question is, can we teach writing strategies to children in grade one? Um, something that, that makes this an especially challenging kind of question is that children in grade one often don't know how to form all of the letters. Uh, they often can spell only a limited number of words. Um, some children may be reading very few words uh, and not really reading independently yet. And so, so a question is, is writing strategy effective to kids who are at that level? So that was a question that my, my research group uh, took up. Uh, so we did an experiment um, on this question uh, working with the London District Catholic School Board. Uh, so we'd like to thank the school board uh, I'd like to thank the administrators, Vince Romeo and Terry Spencer. Uh, and we'd also like to thank the teachers and the consultants who, uh, who helped us with this project. Uh, we worked with nine teachers and 120 students. And the question that we focused on uh, the, that I want to talk about tonight particularly is, is strategy instruction effective for grade one students? And then is it effective for low, medium and high achieving writers in grade one? Um, we did this through teaching a unit of study uh, that focused on stra a strategy for writing stories about me. Um, we focused on stories about me. These are stories where children are writing about their own experience. Uh, so um, these are what are often called journals. Uh, kids in grade one often write journals. Sometimes these are called recounts or we might call them personal narratives. Um, and the, the strategy we taught is just the one that I, uh, I showed you a minute ago. Uh, that is, we taught kids in grade one uh, to use a strategy where they would um, first write the topic, then the setting, beginning, middle, end, and then a feeling about what had happened. Um, and because this was one of the first projects on teaching writing strategies in grade one, we wanted to try to make it as child friendly as we could. Uh, we wanted to try to make it fun for the kids, and we wanted to make it uh, concrete and understandable for them. Um, and we wanted to try to, as much as possible, um, allow kids to learn this strategy even if they couldn't read independently, uh, and even if they could spell only a few words. So those were kind of the design characteristics that we had entering into this project. Uh, so I'll tell you about it, a few of the, the things that we did in this unit to try to make strategy instruction child friendly. Um, we, we started off by using a picture book to teach children about writing. Here we're trying to, to build some metacognition with the kids uh, around writing. So this is a very nice story. Uh, it's by Abby Hanlon. It's called Ralph Tells a Story. And uh, it's, a, it's a story about a boy in grade one, and he has trouble uh, thinking of things to write about. And so the other kids in the class are writing stories in their journals, and he thinks he has no stories. Uh, so he goes through some experiences with his friends and with his teacher, and he learns some things about how to be able to create a story. Um, it's a, this is really accessible to kids. It has funny illustrations, nice text, uh, and it kind of dramatizes for kids the idea that um, creating ideas is something that they can learn how to do. Um, I mentioned earlier that we were interested in being able to do this with kids who weren't able to read independently. So. Um, some of the teaching was done or supported using icons and illustrations. So this, uh, this rectangle that you see here 
Um, this was the basis for a chart that teachers used in teaching. And it was also uh, the basis for a bookmark that kids had to refer to as they were learning the strategy. So for the, the topic, we have a little light bulb. The setting is a little house. And then BME for beginning, middle, and end. And finally, uh, the two phases of Harlequin for the, uh, the feeling. Um, we used a rhyme uh, to help kids remember this. This is a rhyme that was created by Christine Gies, one of the members of our research team. Um, so here is the rhyme kids learned. A story has a topic and a setting, where and when. A story has a beginning and a middle and an end. A story has a feeling, too, my friend. Uh, so the kids learned that rhyme to help them remember the strategy. And they also uh, learned some gestures that went along with that. And Christine created these gestures too. So let me try to get myself on camera and show, show you these gestures. Okay. Okay. I think you can see that now. Okay. So it starts off with the story has a topic and the topic is like a light bulb coming on behind their head and a setting, the house, where and when. The story has a beginning, open the book, a middle, turn the pages, and an end. And a story has a feeling to my friend, so touching their heart. Um, so kids learned the rhyme, they learned the gesture along with the rhyme, uh, and those two things together were meant to help them to remember the strategy. We also wanted to give kids a fun way to practice the strategy, so um, so they played this, this ball game or a beanbag toss game. So the kids sat in a circle on the floor, uh, and the first, the first kid who had the ball would give the first step of the strategy, then they would roll it to another child, that child would give the second step, and so on around the circle, so that the kids could uh, rehearse it. Um, we wanted a fun way for kids to pick topics uh, that were appropriate to this strategy. So we created uh, what we called the Terrific Topics Top Hat. Uh, the Terrific Topics Top Hat um, was a top hat that had about 30 cards in it, and each card had a topic that was fun for grade ones to write about. Uh, so all kinds of topics that lent themselves to personal narratives, like um, something fun I did with a friend, a class trip, a time I went swimming, a special trip, uh, those kinds of things. Um, that was also useful because sometimes the teacher would get the kids writing about a topic, uh, for example, one of the topics the kids wrote about was a time I went swimming. Um, that was a really popular topic with grade one kids. Uh, but there would be some children in the class who had never gone swimming. And so they could pull a, a card from the hat, find a different topic, and write about that. In either case, kids would still be using that to practice the strategy. Um, in teaching this unit, a really big part of it, and I think really the dominant part of it, was teachers modeling the thinking that went on behind writing. So teachers would be, would be at the front of the group. They would be writing a story with the kids, and the teacher would be thinking aloud about, about the thinking that went on behind the writing, and that thinking would include using the strategy. So there was teacher modeling. But then, um, then what was kind of a fun and interesting part of this is the teacher and the kids would then switch roles so that the teacher would role play being a, a child who was writing a story and the kids would become uh, the teacher who is coaching that child. So the teacher would, would be writing a story and the children would be coaching the teacher to use the strategy as well as some other self-regulated processes I'll talk about in a minute. So the kids would be coaching the teacher, and the teachers were really great at bringing this unit to life. Uh, they would ham it up, and they would play the role of a child. They'd pretend to forget, um, forget the strategy. They'd pretend to not be able to think about things to write about, and so on. And so the grade ones have uh, a lot of engagement in jumping in and guiding the teacher through writing a story. Um, there were read-alouds uh, that went along with the unit that were used to stimulate ideas for writing. Uh, so, for example, um, the relatives came. Uh, this is a nice picture book for elementary kids. Um, 
the teacher would read the book to the kids and then the kids would would uh, share a time that relatives had come to visit them and then the kids would write about it. Um, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the, uh, the children coached the teacher. Uh, they also coached one another. And so the children would work in pairs at certain times and one child would become the story writer. So they would be the person uh, coming up with the coming up with this, the content of the story and writing the text. The other student would be the coach, and so the coach would be prompting the writer uh, to remember to use the steps of the strategy, and again, some other self-regulatory pieces that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, when the kids did that, they wore these badges. We had these badges for the kids. So one child would wear the badge to be the story writer, the other would be the coach, and then they would uh, switch roles. Um, I mentioned self-regulation. And so the biggest piece of self-regulation in this unit was learning the strategy. That is the steps of the strategy. But there were some other self-regulatory processes we also emphasized. Um, one of those was coping, uh, coping with problems in writing. Uh, so what we wanted was for children to learn processes that they could use or practices that they could use to try to solve their own problems as they were writing. So to do this, um, the teachers brainstormed with the kids, what are the kinds of things that they find hard in writing or what are the problems that they have when they're writing? And these were quite consistent with grade ones. Uh, they would often say things like, I can't think of something to write about. I don't know how to spell words. Um, my hand gets tired. Writing is boring. I don't know how to write. Those were, those were really common kinds of problems. So the teachers and the kids would brainstorm solutions and they would create these uh, giant thought bubbles. So the yellow giant thought bubbles were about coping. So if a child couldn't think of what to write about, one of the things they could try doing is closing their eyes and remembering an experience that they could tell about. If a child didn't know how to spell a word, something they could do is try sounding out the word. That was one of the strategies that we, uh, that we worked with them on. So they would listen for the sounds in the word and then try to print the letters for those sounds. Um, these giant thought bubbles would, would go up on the wall of the classroom. Um, as the teacher was, was modeling writing, the teacher would model having these problems, like not knowing how to spell a word, uh, not knowing um, what to write about. And then the teacher would you know, hold up these giant thought bubbles as a, as a reminder that these are ways to, to tackle these problems or cope with them. Uh, and the teacher would model solving the problem. And then, you know, as with the strategy, the teacher and the kids would switch roles. So then the teacher would, would pretend to be a child writing a story, and the kids would jump in and coach the teacher with these coping processes. Um, a third piece of self-regulation we wanted to work on with kids was reinforcement, learning to reinforce themselves for good writing behaviors. We especially wanted to emphasize writing behaviors that we know are associated with intrinsic motivation to write or with um, persistence in writing. Uh, so for example, if children, if a child found writing hard, but then they kept with that, we would encourage them to say it to themselves, like even say right out loud, um, that was good, I kept trying. Uh, or if they wrote a story thinking of something that, that made their story good and then saying, my story is good because. Um, so these green thought bubbles, again, the teacher would introduce them to the class, the teacher would model them. Uh, and then we would encourage kids as they were doing their own writing, to uh, reinforce themselves with these same kinds of uh, same kinds of statements. So self-talk was playing a big role here. Um, similarly, we wanted to try to find concrete ways to get grade ones to set goals for their writing. Uh, so this is an example of how we did that. This is a this is a chart, a checklist. And as you can see, it's formatted similarly to the, the chart that was used to teach the strategy. 
Um, the way that teachers use this was um, they started with the child's first writing sample and the teacher went through and looked at what parts of the story the child already had. So this child, for example, had a beginning, a middle, and a feeling. Then the teacher met with groups of students and shared these back with them. And the teacher encouraged the children to set goals for learning to write. So for this child, this would be kind of a, um, average in terms of our sample. This child started with with three parts of the strategy. So this child would probably set the goal of trying to use all six steps of the strategy in their writing. Uh, for other children, a child might have, for example, um, initially only written one sentence for their story. So for some children, their goal, at least at the beginning, was just to move up to having three parts in their story, a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, the important thing is that we were trying to get kids to set goals for their learning uh, so that they would have some ownership and some intention in terms of where they were going. Um, we also wanted to get kids. Oh, we, oh, there it is. Good. It came back. <laughs> we also wanted to give kids uh, some concrete tools to help them self monitor uh, or check their writing. Self monitoring is another important self regulatory process in writing. Um, we wanted kids to, to start to monitor their own writing. And so taking some responsibility and being aware of the quality of what they're writing. Uh, so the way that we made that concrete is we, uh, we, had strips of, uh, we had strips of stickers with the icons representing the steps of the strategy. So, you know, topic setting, beginning, middle, end, feeling. Uh, so the child would write a story and then they would use the, the um, stickers from the strip and they would search through the story and tag where they had used each step of the strategy. Uh, so you can see that this child has written, uh, it was a sunny day in the summer. So there's this topic. Me and daddy were going shopping for stuff to build a fort, beginning. When me and daddy got home, we started to building the fort, middle. Uh, we had really logs we had really wood logs. Uh, that's his end sentence. And then it was fun. So the, um, the reason we wanted this kind of concrete approach to kids uh, checking their stories is that um, with elementary school children, it's often the case that, you know, if we ask if children are handing in a story and we ask them, have you read it over? Um, does it have all the parts that you need? They'll often just say yes and yes. Right. And so we wanted to give them um, a concrete process that they could use to um, to really analyze their story and see if it had all of the parts that they needed. So here was the result of that. Um, I picked this this pair of writing samples uh, because they they're representative of of average um, pretest an average post-test for this group of kids. Um, this was the fall of grade one. Um, and so this was the child's initial story. Uh, time I went to a party. I went to my baby brother's birthday. My baby brother, my baby brother was fun. I like my baby brother. So that was her initial story. Uh, and that was pretty representative of the kids' writing in that uh, initial stories were usually around 15 words long. And they often had, um, you know, one event and maybe another piece of a, of a narrative. And then here's her post-test story. So she says, I was five years old and it was summer. First, I played in the pool. Next, I was sleeping with my floaty. Somebody splashed me, then I woke up. Last I swam in the pool, I felt happy. Okay, so you can see here that now she has a number of events in her story. Uh, she's given a bit of a setting and then she's um, appraised it at the end with a, a feeling. Um, and again, this was fairly typical 
of the kids post test writing it was it was longer it had more parts of the story and again this was a child whose work was average So one of the questions we were interested in was what happened during this instruction with kids who were low, medium, and high in terms of their initial writing. Um, so I'll start with the middle group. What I'm, what I'm presenting data on here is the number of words that kids wrote. Um, we assessed the kids writing on a number of features. One was how many words did they write? Uh, another was what was the overall quality of their writing? We also assessed on what different parts of the story did they have? Um, I'm going to talk about words written because I think it illustrates this, this point fairly clearly. Um, here were the kids who started out in the middle third of the class. So at pre-test, their stories were about 15 words, and at post-test, about 28 words. So 15 words would be around three sentences for grade one. Uh, 28 words would be about four or five sentences for grade one. So that's a substantial improvement. Um, if kids in the fall of grade one are writing stories that are 28 words long, uh, then they're doing quite well. Um, here are the kids who were in the upper third of the class. And so they were starting out writing about 30 words. And at the end, they were still writing around 30 words. Um, these kids, I think, uh, didn't, didn't really need us, right? They were, they were already writing stories at the beginning that had a lot of the qualities that we were teaching with this strategy. If we were doing this study again, um, I think we would build in some enrichment for kids who were already um, stories that had a lot of the characteristics that would be produced by this strategy. I think the most interesting group is the lowest group. Um, as you can see, kids, uh, kids who were in the lowest third of the class initially um, were writing about four words at pretest. Uh, so this was quite short. Um, often these were the kids who were saying, um, I can't think of anything to write or I don't know how to write. Um, some of these kids had the conception that if they don't know how to spell words well, they can't write a story. So I think that this instruction was quite beneficial to kids because it was really encouraging them to reshape those attributions and understand that they could write a story um, even if uh, even if they they weren't um, even if they didn't have a lot of spelling uh, skills at that point. By the end, these kids were writing about 20 words, and, and that's quite good for kids who are in the lower part of the class in the fall of grade one. You can see that with this instruction, the kids in the middle are catching up to the kids at the top of the class. The kids at the bottom of the class are catching up and surpassing where the kids in the middle had originally been. So I started off my talk by saying that I wanted to talk about strategies that are helpful for teachers who are teaching diverse classes, where there's a really wide range of achievement. Uh, and in our classes, we do know that kids have a huge range of achievement. The study was done uh, a few years ago by a researcher at OISE that showed that with each year of elementary school, the span of achievement in a typical class increases by about a year. Uh, so for example, in grade one school, kids have been in school two years. The span of achievement is about two years wide, and that's just taking in 90% of the kids. The other 10% of the kids would be falling outside that band. Um, and then that gap just grows even wider as school goes on. Um, so, uh, so an idea that I would take from this, and, and there's similar findings in other research, uh, is that if we use highly effective evidence-based methods, then that tends to reduce the gap between lower achieving kids and middle and higher achieving kids in the class. Um, among kids who, who start out as struggling writers, for many of them, if they're given effective, explicit, systematic instruction, uh, their, their achievement will tend to improve substantially. It doesn't fix, it doesn't fix all of their difficulties, uh, but it's quite helpful. So what are some evidence-based resources that teachers could use? Um, 
Developing Strategic Young Writers Through Genre Instruction. Uh, this is a book by Zoe Falapakos and Charles MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur is one of the leading researchers in um, special education in writing. Um, and this is a book that focuses on strategy instruction uh, from kindergarten to grade two. This is quite a recent book, 2019. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that previously, almost all the research on uh, teaching strategies in to beginning writers uh, has taken place in grades three to eight. Um, these researchers are American researchers at University of Delaware, uh, and they're one of the few other research groups in the world who's focusing, who are focusing on this issue. Um, there's this group in the United States. Uh, there's my research team here at Western, and then there's also a research group in Portugal uh, that includes people like Aramada and Albes, uh, and they're also focusing on um, begin education for beginning writers, especially strategy education. Another book that uh, some of you will have heard me rec recommend before, because I always recommend this when I give talks, uh, Powerful Writing Strategies for All Students. Um, this, is, uh, this is about strategy instruction. It's aimed at grade three to eight. Um, it covers uh, most of the strategies that are mentioned in the Ontario curriculum. Uh, and it has a lot of useful material in it, including some reproducible material that you can use with students and some background information on strategy instruction. I think these, these two resources are resources that I would really recommend for teachers who are interested in elementary strategy instruction. Okay, so coming back to that idea that we're trying to mobilize um, those bits of language development that feed into written composition. Um, we've just focused on discourse level language. Uh, now I wanna talk a bit about teaching handwriting. Um, handwriting's the second piece of this. So this, this could be printing or cursive. Um, to date, there have been actually over 80 experiments now in kindergarten to grade 12. And what this research shows overall is that if we systematically teach kids printing or handwriting, um, it tends to increase the fluency of their writing and increases the length of the texts that they write, and it increases the overall quality of their writing. Um, again, the issue here seems to be that if children are struggling to form letters, uh, if they're writing very slowly, if they can't read their own writing, then that interferes with their composition. And then that third element of um, language development that feeds into uh, written composition is spelling. Um, there have also been a large number of studies on um, spelling and its impact on uh, writing. Um, to date, there have been 53 experimental studies, more than this now, um, but 53 at the time of this meta-analysis um, from kindergarten to grade 12. Um, and what's been found is that explicit systematic teaching of spelling is more effective than less systematic approaches. So what this means is lists of spelling words and spelling lessons. Um, if kids uh, receive systematic uh, spelling instruction, then those words tend to transfer over into their written composition. Um, one of the myths that circulated in education a few years ago was that children don't transfer spelling words from their, um, from their spelling lessons into their written composition. And sometimes that's true. Uh, children don't remember 100% of what they learn in their spelling lessons, but overall, most words will transfer. Um, similarly with maintenance over time. Over time, children will forget some of the words that they've learned in spelling, but most of them they'll tend to maintain. So in summary, um, in terms of teaching to a varied class, um, I mentioned earlier that there, there are different aspects of this issue, and I've really focused only on one of them. Um, but that aspect that I focused on is trying to teach the skills that will feed writing development. Um, teaching these skills explicitly, teaching them systematically, 
Then a further issue to dig into that I haven't gone into tonight is how to teach each of those effectively. So there's some research on how to make uh, writing strategy instruction, for example, more effective, how to make handwriting instruction more effective, how to make spelling instruction more effective, and so forth. And those are, those are good issues to dig into. I won't have time tonight. So I'd like to say something about what parents can do to help. Uh, and here, um, there's, there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is parents can make a difference in their children's writing development. And the younger that parents start to work with children, the more that that's the case. Uh, so if we get, begin to work with kids in kindergarten and grade one, that's, that's really the best. Um, I should say, though, the bad news is that research is more limited in quality and, and the research tends to be somewhat indirect. Uh, so earlier I was talking about well-designed studies and I was mentioning, you know, for example, in strategy instruction, there are over 120 experimental studies. In um, research on the role of parents in writing education, there's not that kind of strong knowledge base. But I'll try to say, I'll try to say a few uh, kind of introductory things about this. One suggestion I would give to parents is uh, focus on the story. Um, when children write stories to share their experiences, uh, they want to tell you about something that happened to them or something that they did. Uh, and something that is really helpful to, ch to children in terms of their motivation and the quality of their writing is being able to write for an audience who really wants to read their writing. Um, so their most important audience is you, um, their parent or their teacher. Uh, they want you to hear their story. Uh, so the, the first thing to think about is as you're listening, um, initially put your attention there. You might be somewhat taken aback by, um, by your child's spelling in grade one or by your child's um, printing. But initially try to, try to not put your attention there. Try to put it on the story itself. Something that you can do that's effective is help your child learn to print. Um, printing is a, is a skill that parents can work with kids on at home. Um, they, can, they can do this in a couple of ways. They could be echoing what the teacher's doing in class, so following along and practicing with their child at home. Um, alternatively, um, you may want to even just get uh, some reproducible materials or some commercial materials, for example, at the teacher's store or from Amazon, and use those to help your child learn to print. Something else that you can do at home is help your child learn to spell. Um, there are lots of techniques around teaching spelling, and I just want to mention one of them as an example. Um, I've linked a nice YouTube video that illustrates this. Uh, and so um, this, this is a child who is, this is what we would call invented spelling, and here it's being done with word boxes. Uh, so this child's trying to spell the word rip, and so the child says the word and they stretch it out. So rip, right? And they would listen for the sounds. You would ask the child to listen for the sounds. So what sound do you hear at the beginning of the word? Rip, rrr, and then get them to print a letter for that sound. So you're trying to teach them that strategy of, we would say, phonemically segmenting the word and printing the sounds that they hear. Even if the child spells the word incorrectly, that practice in listening for the sounds in words and using letters to represent those sounds at the grade one level is useful for the child and it will help to improve their spelling and their, their uh, reading. Um, with all of these uh, skills, it's important to start where your child is and go at their pace. Um, so the so so I guess in I guess in this picture, you know that the child is the child is leading, and I guess we're we're the horse, right? The, <laughs> we're the horse. Uh, we have to follow the child's pace. Um, and so you know, for example, in grade one, uh, your child may be starting the year spelling only their own name, right? And or they may know only how to form a few letters. 
And so rather than thinking about having kind of uh, set expectations in terms of how fast they should learn or how much they could, should learn, if you follow their pace, uh, then that will be less frustrating for them and probably more effective in the long run. So for example, if a child learns to print one new letter each week, uh, that, can, that can be very good for that child. Or if the child learns to spell only a few new words each week, uh, that, can be, uh, that can be effective. Okay, so we're coming toward the end of our time and I wanna leave some time for questions. So I'm going to jump down to the conclusion. Um, I wanna leave you with three thoughts. Uh, the first thought is the challenges of early writing uh, and early writing intervention are numerous, but the solutions that we have are versatile solutions. Um, so for example, writing strategy instruction. There are lots of reasons, as I pointed out, that kids can struggle with writing. But what the research shows so far is that writing strategy instruction is effective for typically developing kids, kids with low and high income, that research just came out last month, kids with learning disabilities, struggling writers. So writers who are um, low achieving, but who don't necessarily have a, a reading or writing disability, kids with ADHD, kids with emotional and behavioral disorders, kids who are English language learners, kids with autism spectrum disorders. There's research on all of these groups and writing strategy instruction is substantially helpful to all of them and usually effect sizes are large. So as we think about dealing with the problems that kids have in writing, um, initially it may seem overwhelming because there are so many different reasons kids can struggle with writing. Um, but a number of the solutions in terms of early intervention in writing are versatile and can be used to address uh, a wide range of problems. Second idea would be effect sizes are medium to large. So writing strategy instruction, usually big effects on kids learning. Um, handwriting instruction and spelling instruction have a more medium sized impact on kids written composition. Um, but, but those are good tools in the toolkit because if we can get an, a medium effect on kids learning or a large effect on kids learning and then repeat that from week to week, from unit to unit throughout grade one, um, then kids will be making substantial progress. Also, um, what the research on parents and volunteers shows is that they can significantly help beginning writers. And that's particularly true if we provide them with some training. Uh, so for example, providing workshops uh, for parents or providing workshops for volunteers to train them a bit to work with their kids on writing skills uh, is something that can pay off in terms of children's achievement. Um, so the message I'd like to leave you with is be optimistic. Uh, I think that um, early writing education is a kind of a good news story uh, in education. Finally, I'd like to thank my research team. Uh, Jill Dombrowski, I noticed she's here with us tonight. Christine Gies, Ashley Bildfeld, Kristen Shaw, uh, and Serena Thompson is also with us tonight. So thank you to the members of my research team. They worked with me on uh, the project I was describing earlier. So thank you for that. I'd like to uh, take your questions now. And I think what we're going to do is people will raise their hand and Jen will turn on your microphone uh, and then I'll respond to your question. Um, you can find the icon for raising your hand um, in the middle of your screen. You'll see four icons, uh, middle bottom of your screen, there's a hand up. Okay, okay. Uh, Bev, do you want to go ahead? You can um, enable your microphone. Hello. Hi. Hi, Bev. Hi, hello. Wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you so, so much. I, I, have, a, I have a really a burning question. Um, in grade one and grade two, is there a ballpark like number of sentences or words that students should be printing for a task? Yeah, thanks for that question. 
Um, I, I don't know that there's a really good body of literature that, that shows us exactly where children would fall in that distribution of how much they're writing. Um, I think people who, who have experience teaching the primary grades have a good sense of that. Um, I think if children are writing a few sentences in grade one, uh, particularly in the fall, that's really good. And then in the spring term, you know, if children are writing a paragraph in grade one, that's really good. Uh, and then in grade two, you know, children continue to progress and they diverge. So we might see better writers in grade two writing several paragraphs. Um, I hope that I hope that answer is helpful. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, do we have any other questions? Please feel free to raise your hands or you can use the chat function. Oh, Daniel, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, working. I'm hearing a lot of static. Maybe the chat might be better. I think we lost Daniel. Uh oh. All right, Dana, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Great. Uh, wonderful talk, Perry. Uh, I was just wondering, in terms of the quality of the writing that the students were producing, did you get a sense? I'm sure you did, but I'm wondering about um, the different components of the story and whether or not you saw more growth in one area versus versus another. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that would really that really drove that is that there were certain parts of a story that kids typically were including at the beginning. And so at the beginning, um, almost all of the kids were writing about at least one event. And then some kids were writing sort of a beginning and middle of a story or a middle and an end. Um, a few kids were putting in a feeling. What we were typically not seeing was a setting. Um, so the areas that we were really seeing more growth was in uh, having a setting and then having, you know, all three of those pieces, a kind of an arc of a beginning, middle, end, and being more consistent about uh, including a feeling. Interestingly, one part of the strategy that was not very useful often was the topic. Uh, like we, the strategy included children writing a topic, but often there was kind of an assigned topic. Um, and so then it was redundant for the child to then repeat that topic. And it didn't add a lot to their text. Something that was interesting that kids often put into their text that we didn't actually teach them um, was elaboration. So often kids would give the elements that we taught and then something they would do to make their stories even better is some kids would then elaborate on those. Um, so that was not part of our strategy instruction, but it was something they did that made their stories uh, better. Okay, we've got a question here from Dana Lanceri. Um, wondering whether the high starters improved on any measures other than the number of words, such as the degree to which they accurately applied the stickers. Oh, thanks for the question. Um, we, we actually didn't do a check on how accurate the kids were in their self-monitoring. Um, that's, that's data that I would like to collect in the future, but we didn't do that. Um, I can say that the different dependent variables, like number of parts of the story, overall quality of the story, and length of the story, um, were highly correlated. So kids who improved on one tended to improve on the others. Thanks, Daniel. Um, do we have any other questions? I'm not 
seeing any hands raised. If anybody has a question, you can uh, just go ahead and, and unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, Jill, go ahead. So you can just unmute yourself oh, or you can yeah, use the chat. Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Jill. Yep. Hello. I just wanted to say, as witness to being a researcher and a parent, the one thing I really appreciated about the work that we did is that it catered to different learners at different places uh, in the child's uh, writing uh, capacity. Uh, you know, the idea of the teacher um, acting out some of the things Perry showed, uh, I think would have really helped kids that were a little bit more oral listener or visual or oral. And I think that made a, a big impact on some of the kids. I mean, it, it made an impact on me because I think I would have, as a, I'm that kind of learner. So anyway, I, I always really enjoyed watching how this progressed. So good job, Barry and team. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. So, so uh, for the audience, Jill was on our research team. So she was out uh, observing in classrooms and uh, helping to assess the students. Thanks for that, Jill. Okay. More questions? Comments? Anecdotes? Well, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us. Um, thanks for listening to my talk. Uh, I appreciate your interest in that. Um, I think that if you're interested, some people asked about copies of the slides, uh, partly I think because there's, there's a couple of hyperlinks in the slides. So if you're interested in those, I think that, um, uh, I think Jen can share them uh, onto the OWL website. Um, otherwise, uh, have a good evening, and I hope everyone stays healthy uh, during um, these weeks of COVID. Um, I'm just seeing some questions coming in. Yes, a recording will be available. So what we'll do is um, on the community speaker webpage, there's a link to past presentations. And so um, it takes a day or so for the video processing to happen. So by uh, next week sometime, you'll be able to go to that past presentations link and download and view the recording. And I'll also post um, a copy of Perry's slides as he just mentioned. And if any of your um, colleagues missed the presentation and they're not really sure where that website is, you can just ask people to contact me. Again, Jen Heidenheim in the research office at Western Faculty of Education, and I can send you links or um, the files. And again, if you'd like to be on our mailing list, just send me a note and I will happily add you. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, good night, everybody. All right. Thank you, Perry. Good night. Closing the recording, and I will end the meeting. <laughs>